o'clock news starts right now. Confusion and unanswered questions at Guide Dogs of Texas. Legal matters with the nonprofit are creating tension among volunteers, former employees, and even clients. Some are concerned for the well-being of staff and the future of the organization whose mission is to help visually impaired Texans increase their freedom, mobility, and independence. Our Jonathan Coto spoke with people at a protest today outside of Guide Dogs of Texas to learn what this is all about. No show CEO has to go. Current and former employees along with volunteers and clients of the Guide Dogs of Texas protesting outside the agency's office today arguing that the work environment has not been a good one. So since I've started working here we've I've noticed that our female staff has been experiencing some harassment. Um, Working conditions haven't been quite in line with the values that our company holds. The man at the center of those complaints is new CEO Billy Rader. Protesters say the board has taken no action on their claims and suggest the CEO has even retaliated against a whistleblower. I'm not going to get into allegations and I know there's EEOC going towards the people in there, but basically it really uh, ends up that three people, three people that have closed this down have put them and their ego above the mission statement of Guide Dogs of Texas. They've shut it down. One thing the Guide Dogs of Texas has done is get a temporary restraining order against three current employees. The petition filed on Wednesday, the organization acknowledged these employees have voiced their concerns, but that it has brought outside counsel to address and investigate claims. The petition goes on to say that these three current employees have gone so far as to lock the CEO out of the payroll system and remove him as an administrator in other financial software. The agency is accusing these employees of defamation and theft. The concern of the clients is what does the future hold for guide dogs of Texas? It's also not just me, it's everybody in San Antonio and in Texas that benefits from guide dogs of Texas because we're not just for San Antonio, we're for all of Texas. and. It's not just my safety, it's everybody who is vision impaired or legally blind, all of their safety as well. We reached out to the CEO and his team who were only able to provide a statement that says they will remain committed to providing service to visually impaired Texans and to date, investigations have not revealed any wrongdoings. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Families from Uvalde embarked on a more than eight hour trip to the Rio Grande Valley ahead of tonight's gubernatorial debate. They held a rally at a press conference there this afternoon to encourage Texans to vote and take their message to end gun violence directly to Governor Greg Abbott. Alicia Barrera was at that event today and spoke to some of the families who say they will never give up. Woke up early, got our kids up and ready for school, um, then we had to leave. 560 miles in less than 24 hours. Parents from Uvalde traveled by bus to the city of Edinburgh. It's exhausting, we're tired, we miss our kids. This is important uh, and I hope people understand that. They won't be present at tonight's debate as there is not an audience for either party, but are once again recounting the moments of terror, panic and utter heartbreak lived outside of Robb Elementary. I'm speaking directly to moms when I say our babies' lives are on that ballot. It happened to me, it happened to you, it can happen to you. And this pain, it'll bring you to your knees begging for an end. It's a pain thousands of strangers from all over the state and country displayed through flowers, memorials, and visits to the site of the massacre. They were massacred in their classrooms. Let me say that one more time. They were massacred in their classrooms. 18 weeks later, it's a pain they hope voters will channel at the polls. We are here today to ask you to help keep our children and teachers safe. We are here to speak up so that children are not being murdered in their classrooms anymore. They continue to ask for stricter gun laws in Texas, raising the age limit to purchase weapons to 21 and a special session. However, Governor Greg Abbott has continually pushed back on those calls. And they basically just close the doors. They don't listen to anything we have to say. They put it all on, on mental awareness, mental, mental illness. 
This afternoon when those families arrived, they were greeted by Beto O'Rourke personally and his team. But no matter what the outcome is in November, in the case of Lu Lexi Rubio's parents, they say that they are determined to carry on this fight at the federal level. And what they'll be pushing for, continue pushing for, is a complete ban on assault rifles. And they, again, just want people to get out there and vote. As for tonight, coverage starts at 6 p.m. We already checked in. We have our media badges. Actually, just saw Steve Spreeser a few minutes ago. So everything is ready. Please expect a full coverage of that, a wrap of that tonight on the Night Beat. We'll be live again. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. All right. Thank you, Alicia. And a reminder that during tonight's debate, Steve Spreester is one of the panelists. We're also holding a virtual watch party for our KSAT insider. Stephanie Jimenez and myself will be chatting with you online, answering questions about topics that come up during this debate, giving you some more context to these topics. That live stream and our debate coverage on air starts at 7 p.m. As a reminder, Election Day is November 8th. Back here at home, two teenagers dead, shot in broad daylight, and the killer is still on the loose tonight. San Antonio police reaching out to the community to help them identify and capture the alleged suspect. The department releasing surveillance video today. Those murders happened back on September 18th, just before 11 a.m. Police say the video shows a man walking into a gas station on East Houston. He got out of a black Cadillac that was seen at the shooting on Noblewood Drive, where the two teenage boys ages 16 and 17 were killed. According to police, the people inside the Cadillac were seen shooting into the victim's car. Take a good look at your screen one more time. If you know who this man is in the video, you are asked to call SAPD's homicide unit, their number 210-207-7635. A fundraiser to feed the soul of Ukraine. The nonprofit organization Ukrainian San Antonio will be raising money this weekend for the war torn country by serving a popular dish. It also comes on the day that Russia claims it will absorb Ukrainian territories in what would be the largest forcible annexation of European land since 1945. Our RJ Mark has visited with Ukrainian San Antonio to learn more about this dish, what it means overseas, and how you can help the organization's cause. And the Ukrainian soul is in this dish. Elena Garcia was born and raised in Ukraine and grew up eating borscht, a traditional Ukraine daily meal. It's very well known in the world. It's now on the second place around on the list of the Ukrainian most delicious, uh, on the world, most delicious soups in the world. The soup is considered to be a symbol of unity and strength and how many Ukrainians express their love for the country. Ukraine is so rich with traditions. Every region of Ukraine has its own recipe of cooking borscht. Olga Veritelnik left Ukraine in 1993. She and her husband Simon opened the European Dumplings food trunk on the far west side where they serve the traditional cuisine. Kosher chicken, uh, potato, uh, lots of wedges and cabbage, uh, pepper, uh, uh, jalapeno, uh, carrots, um, uh, tomato sauce and lots of lots of spices. And this weekend Olga will be serving borscht to help her loved ones back home. The food truck and Ukrainian San Antonio are hosting a three-day fundraiser. They want the proceeds from this warm and inviting dish to help protect Ukrainians from the cold winter months. I have lots of friends there, my relative there, and it's getting cold there. We have so many requests for thermal uh, 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 wear, you know, and boots, and uh, it's the, the, the need is endless. Yes, and like I said, winter is coming, and uh, it's so much more needed. This fundraiser runs through 6 p.m. Sunday, so organizers are asking that you come out and enjoy a delicious bowl of this traditional Ukrainian food with the suggested donation of just $5 a bowl. Reporting from the far west side, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at traffic out there during this Friday 6 o'clock commute. I-35 North at Loop 410. This is a familiar trouble spot, especially this time of day. No real reason for the tie up other than it is I-35 North. So something to be aware of in this area. It's always Let's take a live look outside with live cam on this Friday. Another gorgeous day. No rain in sight. We certainly need some of that. But if it's going to be this pretty, we might as well enjoy it. I mean, we can't order the rain, we can't make it happen, so at least it can be...
comfortable outside. We'll take that. It was another pleasant morning, 64 officially at the airport in San Antonio, but many outlying areas did drop down into the 50s. 91 was our high temperature, so another pretty big temperature spread as we often see in these transition seasons. You get into fall and spring and you get the cooler mornings and warmer afternoons, especially with the dry air that we have. Right now, Eagle Pass at 90 along with Carrizo Springs. 91 in Pleasanton, 88 currently officially at the airport in town and of course 0% chance of precipitation tonight. Beautiful for uh, Friday night football. Clear sky, calm wind and low humidity by 8 o'clock. We're talking 84 degrees, 10 o'clock, 81 and then midnight already down to 73. We'll talk about how cool it's going to get and where in just a bit along with tropical storm Orlean in the Pacific and how that's going to affect our weather this weekend. Tim. Thank you, Adam. Still to come on the News at 6, a local event returns to help raise awareness and shine a light on blood cancers. A story of hope to inspire support right after this break. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. More San Antonians are going to Florida to help victims of Hurricane Ian. The San Antonio Fire Department, just one example, it's doing something very special to help the people there recover. We know that a crew is headed to Florida right now. Plus, he was accused in a double murder case. Then the charges were dropped, but prosecutors in San Antonio say it was merely a delay. Now that man is re-indicted, and the mother of one of the victims in the case speaks about her renewed call for justice. Plus, we're going to bring you the highlights from tonight's one and only gubernatorial debate. We'll talk about these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. All right, thanks, Stephanie. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Light the Night event is back and in person for the first time since 2019. It raises funds and awareness for blood cancers. Our John Paul Baraja sat down with an LLS organizer and a cancer survivor to talk about how this event brings light to the darkness of cancer. It was almost like uh, being hit by an 800 pound gorilla and feeling like, you know, your life is over. It's a common thought after being diagnosed with a form of blood cancer. Gregory Proctor is living proof that it shouldn't be. And the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, or LLS, is working to find a cure, but every second counts. Every three minutes somebody is diagnosed, every nine minutes somebody's losing their life to blood cancer. So we are, um, we're really trying to move the needle. Their main goals are to assist in patient support and education, as well as research. Their annual Light the Night event is a major part of that. Thousands of people gather to walk a mile holding lanterns to illuminate hope, remember, honor, and support those affected by blood cancer. Each lantern has a different meaning. Red is for those showing support, yellow is for those walking in memory of a loved one who's passed, and white is for the survivors. LLS expects to raise well over a million dollars this year and anticipates 5,000 people here at Hemisphere for Light the Night, Saturday, October 8th. I'm feeling a lot better than I did a year ago. But it wouldn't have been for LLS. I, I assure you, I probably wouldn't be here today. LLS tells us, unfortunately, there is no early detection for blood cancer. They say people have to listen to their body, and if something doesn't feel right, don't ignore it. As for those who are currently fighting, Proctor has a message. If you believe that there is hope, then you will overcome whatever disease there is. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. And we here at KSAT invite you to spread some of that hope with us at the Light the Night event at Hemisphere Park on October 8th at 6 p.m. If you scan this QR code, it'll take you right to the donations and registration page. We've had some beautiful mornings, a nice string of somewhat fall-like weather, at least to start the days over the past week. And it's really going to continue. Now, our morning temperatures will climb up out of the upper 50s and into the low to mid 60s as we progress into next week. But it's still going to be relatively comfortable. And keep in mind, below average. The average high is 66, and we're going to still be below that. I take a look at the readings across the state. We'll start with temperatures, then we'll get into what's left of Ian, Tropical Storm Orlean in the Pacific, and how that's going to affect us. But let's get you prepared for the weekend first. Laredo now 92. That's really the hot spot on the map, other than Catula, currently at 94. Gonzalez 89. And as we fast forward to tomorrow morning, I mean, temperatures this evening will be just like the past couple of days. Just plan for 80s, then 70s. And tomorrow morning, we'll start today right around 60 degrees here in San Antonio, probably an even 60 officially. Canyon Lake, about 57. Kerrville, 57. And Creasel Springs, 64. Yeah, you get to Elmendorf, about 59. Timberwood Park, 57. So some folks may want the 
long sleeves early around sunrise, but we're going to warm up quickly. And by the afternoon, we're going to be in the upper 80s to near 90. So about 89 downtown, 88 Stone Oak, Seguin, 88 and 89 the high in Hondo. Our afternoon temperatures will actually take a little bit of a slide, just a few degrees, not enough to really notice or feel the difference, but we'll probably drop a little bit into the mid 80s by Monday and then a little closer to 90 degrees as we get farther into next week. And one reason we're trimming off a few degrees Sunday and Monday is just a little extra cloud cover that's moving in. But the air is so dry right now. We still have these dew points down in the 40s and 50s, and this has been an extended period of lack of mugginess. We haven't had that return flow off the Gulf of Mexico and I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. So our dew point trend keeps us actually very comfortable. Notice this line in the very dry category here for at least the next seven afternoons. So that also gives us those refreshing mornings and then the quick temperature rise to near 90 in the afternoon. All right, let's talk about the pattern because obviously it's very quiet across Texas. Nothing happening around here. We can't even get a cloud to form. We don't even have enough moisture for that really. But you look at the remnants of Ian, now it's post tropical storm Ian, quickly, quickly weakening in terms of the winds, but still packing a punch with the rainfall and potential flooding, South Carolina, North Carolina, and actually the precipitation, the rain spreads all the way up into Washington DC now and approaching uh, base parts of Southern Pennsylvania, basically the Gettysburg area. And the remnants will continu continue to track north, we're not going to see any moisture from that. And now it's at least a progressive system and we'll keep moving and not just sit in one spot. Then Tropical Storm Orlean. This is west of Acapulco out in the Pacific, and this is going to track northward, becoming a hurricane, Cat 1 or Cat 2, and then make landfall somewhere near Mazatlan, Mexico, midday Monday. The remnants of it moving over the higher terrain, the mountains of Mexico, and sometimes we can tap into that moisture to help us in terms of rainfall. But unfortunately, I just think we're going to get some high clouds from it. That's it. So it'll add a little variety to the sky other than just sunshine and a baby blue sky. We'll actually have some high clouds by Sunday and then some mid and high clouds by Monday, but nothing but sunshine tomorrow. 60 in the morning, 89 in the afternoon, a gentle easterly breeze, 5 to 10 by Sunday. Those nice wispy high thin clouds streaming overhead and in turn we will trim off a few more degrees, 87 for the high and then Monday those clouds could think it thicken a little bit. So about 86 the high temperature and then next week pretty straightforward uh, dry conditions. You can't make rain without the humidity, unfortunately. Yeah, we will wait. Thank you, Adam. Our Larry Ramirez is all fueled up and ready for another BGC road trip. He joins us live from his first stop tonight, <laughs> Tom Moore High School. Hey, Larry. Yeah, hey guys, up here in the beautiful hill country, it's nice and cool and we're about uh, 41 minutes away from this district matchup between Ingram Tom Moore and the Cole Cougars. Coming up, we're going to have more about this district matchup. It is the opener for the Warriors when it comes to district play. Cole played a district game last week and in the college game, it is game day for UTSA as they start conference play looking to defend their CUSA championship coming up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome live to Ingram Tom Moore High School, where tonight the Warriors will take on the Cole Cougars in a district football matchup. And I'm telling you, the Warriors are having a great season, folks, and they want to keep it rolling right here tonight at home. So the Warriors are 3-1 and one to this point in the season, and they're riding a three-game winning streak heading into their district opener here tonight. Led by their second-year head coach, Tate Damasco, the Warriors are playing some of their best football in a very long time. Coach Damasco is from Kerrville, and he's happy to be back in the Hill Country. This is his first head coaching gig, and his 20th season and overall as a football coach. He spent his first 18 years in San Antonio, Roosevelt, Brandeis, Madison, and Reagan before coming back to his home area. We asked Coach and two of his guys how they feel about their season so far. Obviously, this is our second year in the program, and so our kids are learning kind of what the expectations are, and they're kind of getting familiar with what we're asking them to do. And so we've been really excited about the way they've attacked this year. Um, you know, our keys are, are if we don't turn the ball over, you know, we're, we're going to be in a lot of games. We play some good defense, and so they've kind of taken that approach, and that's kind of what we built this program around, defense. I feel pretty confident in us. I mean, I've played on this varsity football team for four years now. Um, we've only ever had one winning streak other than this year, and that was two years ago, and we went 5-5, five and five, didn't win a single district game. So 
I think we're in a pretty good position to go somewhere, and it'd be really nice to go somewhere. I feel pretty great about the team. You know, it's really not about the three and one. It's about more becoming the one and zero in district. So let's we'll see how that goes. Cole is 0-5 overall this season after dropping its district opener to Lano last Friday, 59-0. Fresh and ready to go after a bye week, the Warriors are not overlooking the Cole Cougars. Um, I feel pretty confident that we can give them a fight. I'm sure they're going to come and want to fight back with us, but I'm pretty confident that as long as we go out there and be who we need to be, I'm sure we could we can give them a fight right back. It's going to be a huge game. You know, they've already got one district game underneath their belt. Um, and so to get back in the race, they need to win. And, and we need to start the race the right way. Um, you know, so this is be this will be a great contest for us. Got utmost respect for Coach Kissy and those guys at Cole. Uh, I feel like we have a, a really good chance at this. You know, there's, there's we have a really great chance, but it's never 100% chance of us winning or us losing. So, you know, it's really how, how physical and how we play as a team. So, a really big problem last year. Cole will enjoy an off week after this game before resuming district play Friday, October 14th at home against Luling. Check out the road trip tonight. Cole at Tom Moore, Bastrop at Kerrville Tybee, and Rock Springs will visit Center Point. Highlights on the night beat and biggamecoverage.com. We've got plenty of live streaming games this weekend, so you can scan the QR code on your screen to see those matchups and the ways to access those streams. In the college game, UTSA football kicks off Conference USA play at the bottom of the hour, 6.30 at Middle Tennessee. It is the Roadrunners versus the Blue Raiders as UTSA begins defense of its Conference USA title. Middle Tennessee is coming off an upset win of then number 25 Miami, 45-31. An impressive road win for Middle Tennessee that certainly caught the Roadrunners' attention. I always say it's any given day. You know, some people take other opponents lightly. Some people want to play higher to the higher standard of the team that they're playing. So really any given day, anybody can beat anybody in this game. Um, it's never set in stone. Um, so um, what they did to Miami when they went up there in, the, in that environment and they, they played their tails off and they had some success up there and you know they won they won pretty comfortably and, and they, did, they did do well. So um, it'll be a good test for us and we're excited to, to accept that challenge. Good luck to the Roadrunners tonight. Hey, talking about another team that's tough to beat. Of course, I'm talking about David and RJ, and they're hanging out at Hero <laughs> Stadium. So let's check in with those guys live. Yeah, that's right, Larry. We are hanging out with the Madison Mavericks and the Clark Cougars on a bit of a old school yeah. matchup, yeah. but a new rivalry, David. Yeah, well, it seems like we were talking just a second there. It seems like this ought to be like a playoff matchup. Yeah. It's Clark and Madison because years ago, they weren't in the yeah. same district, and now all of a sudden they're in the same district because there's so many schools and you got to move things around a little bit. And it, I, I do believe it is homecoming yes. for Madison. I just want you. I just want you to look at these bumps. Look at the size of these things. I mean, that's like. 50, 60 pounds of bum right there laying yeah. on the ground. You're getting a workout just carrying around these bums. Of course, we don't mess around when it comes to homecoming here in Texas and not messing around with high school football. As Larry mentioned, a lot of games on the BGC app. All you got to do is download this. Those are live, free live streams. David. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. There's a good one down the street at Coma. There's good games all over town because now the district play is getting started in week six. All right. Boom. Back to you guys as we head out from Hero Stadium. Lots of high school football on the menu tonight. Thank you, yeah, gentlemen. Yeah, not a Friday without those two. We'll be right back. The response to Ian's impact continuing tonight. CPS Energy crews are already in Florida, and they're on the move again. Earlier this week, they left San Antonio, stopped in Mobile, Alabama, and then made it to Jacksonville, Florida to help out. And right now, they are heading to Lakeland, Florida, which is just west of Tampa Bay. Today, the utility released a new picture as they all prepared to head to their next destination. The 35-member crew from CPS Energy plans to help 23,000 people who are without power there in Lakeland, Florida. As people across Florida begin the long road to recovery after Ian, the economic toll is staggering. Damage assessments still being made right now, but early estimates are nearing $70 billion. ABC's Andrea Fujii with that story. As cleanup begins from Hurricane Ian, so does the realization of how much it will take to rebuild. We started to see the water coming through the windows. I would say it'd take a few days to get everything cleaned. 
Ian, one of the most powerful hurricanes to make landfall on the U.S., is expected to have caused upwards of $67 billion in damage. A large number, but less than half of Hurricane Katrina's price tag of $161 billion. We floated on a bed all the way up to the ceiling. We only had a foot of air left. Hurricane Ian destroyed Hallie's rental home in Fort Myers, about a mile from the Gulf. Our Ginger Z caught up with her. So I don't have a home, I don't have a car, and I don't have a job because I used to clean these units. So I'm. So you lost. I'm, I'm homeless and scared. A recent report found 60% of Florida residents do not have flood insurance. But help is on the way. I approve the governor's most recent request for the expedited major disaster declaration. President Biden promising nearly $38,000 for people who don't have enough home insurance and another 38000 for lost property. More than 8,700 people already registering for help with FEMA. And it's not just homes and businesses. Florida produces 70% of citrus, like oranges and grapefruit. So depending on the damage to crops, experts warn that fruit and juice prices may rise. Economists do not expect the price of oil and gas to rise as Florida is not an energy producer. As for insurance costs, Florida homeowners already pay the highest average premiums in the country, and experts expect that number to only go up because of Hurricane Ian. And with so many claims, some insurance companies may not be able to pay all of them out. Andrea Fuji, ABC News, New York. And a helping hand to those impacted by the devastation of Hurricane Ian. Monday, we'll be hosting a phone bank in partnership with the Red Cross to raise money for relief efforts in Florida. Those phone lines will be open from noon to 7 p.m. on Monday. Look for the number then. News happening around America today. New York City police investigating after someone sprayed red paint on the facade of the Russian consulate. The vandalism discovered on the same day Russia's President Vladimir Putin signs documents to annex several Ukrainian regions. Authorities there say they are treating the act as a, quote, possible bias incident. This morning, Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson made her debut at the high court in a traditional and formal ceremony. Justice Jackson again took the oath to serve on the Supreme Court during the investiture ceremony. Then she walked down the Supreme Court steps with Chief Justice John Roberts. She was then joined by her husband. Today's ceremony was all ceremony, nothing official, because Justice Jackson is already on the job. She was sworn in in June, becoming the sixth woman and the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court. In consumer news, what is old is new again, at least in price. Rising interest rates and high prices making used, car too, used cars too expensive for some people shopping for a car. Used car prices are up nearly 50% from August 2019. Some analysts say it is bad news for CarMax, the largest used car dealer in the U.S. Yesterday, the company reported its earnings plunged more than 50% as the number of cars sold in the quarter fell 6.4% compared to the same quarter just one year ago. The company is blaming high car prices fueled by inflation, climbing interest rates, and low consumer confidence. Not to mention a shortage of parts, particularly computer chips, which have a limited supply. And speaking of car shopping, New York's governor announcing today a mandate that will require 68% of new cars sold in that state be electric vehicles between 2030 and 2035. Governor Kathy Hochul says that by 2026, zero emissions vehicles must make up 35% of new car sales. Even school buses are part of this plan. But there are critics, of course. They point out that electric vehicles are pricey and there aren't enough places to charge them. Hogel says that's why her plan is extending a $2,000 rebate program and that $250 million is being spent to build new charging stations. We'll be right back. Some local students are embracing their culture through a new club at school. Tiffany Huertas takes us to Kip Aspire Academy and inside a Latina club there, where she tells us students are learning about the richness of their family background. 
this is a great group. Mia Martinez is making friends and learning about different cultures at a new club at school. Something that uh, made me want to join this club was just knowing that I could, I would be able to learn about my heritage. Mia is a member of the Proud Latinas, a club at Kip Aspire Academy, where Latina students celebrate their culture and discuss topics impacting the Latino community. ESL coordinator Fiorella Facini helped create this club. Um, we wanted just to create a safe space for the girls to uh, where they can feel empowered as Latina. Last school year, they had different activities. We created for Hispanic Heritage Month posters from different um, Hispanic famous people and then from different countries. And then we also um, did an altar here at school and we also celebrated the Mexico independence with the mariachi. So we welcomed everybody in the morning with mariachis. This fall, students are excited about a new project. And I think that it just brings us all together. It helps us learn about more of of the, our loved ones that have passed away and we just get to know each other more. The Proud Latinas will be creating an altar made by the students and it will be displayed at Muertos Fest at Hemisphere. And we've seen a lot of changes in different uh, girls, like their self-esteem has gone up, their sense of leadership, like we've seen girls that thought they couldn't like be leaders, be leaders of different projects that we have. I think everybody should be learning about and something that should be a part of every school. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12. 12 News. All right, let's take a look outside with live cam this evening as we kick off the weekend here. Of course, hoping that this nice weather we've had this week keeps going through Saturday, Sunday, Adam. Oh, it's going to. And I know we can't drum up any rain, but if there's any consolation, at least it's comfortable outside. And it's going to remain comfortable. The humidity is going to stay at bay. You will notice one little change this weekend, and that's actually a result of Tropical Storm Orlean just off the western coast of Mexico. I'll tell you more about that. And of course, take a look at our temperature trend and how long these refreshing mornings will last in just a bit. In the buzz today, The Daily Show host Trevor Noah has announced he is stepping away from the anchor desk. In a video statement shared on Twitter, Noah says that after seven years as host of the Comedy Central satirical news program, his time is up. Noah, a stand-up comedian from South Africa, was a relative newcomer to American audiences when he was named as host of The Daily Show in 2015 after Jon Stewart signed off. Noah hinted that his decision to leave the show is rooted in his desire to return to more stand-up work. So far, he has not revealed when his final show will be, but he said he'll be around for a while. Cool news from space. We can now see the aftermath of NASA's most recent mission. The agency releasing images taken before and after the DART spacecraft intentionally hit an asteroid earlier this week. The Hubble and James Webb telescopes were pointed right at that asteroid when the impact was made. It looks like clouds of stuff were thrown from the asteroid after that contact. The mission marked the first time that NASA was able to purposely crash into an asteroid and potentially change it change its trajectory. Scientists will use information from both telescopes in order to learn more about the crash and its overall impact. The Royal Mint confirming today that coins featuring King Charles III will enter circulation alongside those of Queen Elizabeth II. Here's a quote from the official maker of UK coins. The first coins bearing the effigy of His Majesty King Charles III will enter circulation in line with demand from banks and post offices. Now that means coins featuring King Charles III and Queen Elizabeth II will co-circulate for years to come. Yeah, according to the UK maker, there are approximately 27 billion coins in circulation that feature the Queen. In about two weeks, you'll have the chance to stay here. It is the actual set of the brand new Hocus Pocus 2 movie, The Sanderson House, located deep in the woods of Salem, Massachusetts. It will be available as an Airbnb. Guests can try performing some enchantments from the Book of Spells, but you don't need Hocus Pocus magic to actually stay here. Two guests can get an exclusive stay for $31. The listing opens October 12th at 1 p.m. And the movie, Hocus Pocus 2, began streaming on Disney Plus today. I guess the catch is you have to beat everybody to book that. Yeah, there you that go. $31. All right, so the highlight weather-wise this week, it's been these low humidity mornings. 
It's felt so nice, and I'm hoping those stick around. We got more time to enjoy it in the weekend. Yes, quite often this time of year, they're very short lived. You know, you have a front move through, and then everything goes back to normal, and you get the humidity in place, and it's sticky. That's not the case this go around, as the dry air is going to stay intact. That means more comfortable mornings. Warm afternoons, however, with that nearly 30 degree temperature spread from the morning to the afternoon. And we also have Tropical Storm Orlean to talk about and how that's going to add a little variety to our sky this upcoming weekend. All right, let's take a look at our satellite and radar first. It's quiet around Texas and around San Antonio, of course. This dry air, we can't even make a cloud. Nonetheless, rainfall and a little ridge of high pressure still over us. But you can really see on the right hand side of your screen there what we're focusing on now is post tropical storm Ian. Uh, basically, it's losing its tropical characteristics, turning into a post tropical storm, still packing a little bit of a punch. Some winds around 70 to 85 miles per hour near the center of it, but it's mainly just a windy, rainy system right now that's moving up the mid Atlantic coastline and will continue to do so as it weakens, but drops more rainfall. Uh, some localized flooding is really the only threat there with that. Now we're watching tropical storm Orlean, not because it's going to have a big impact on our weather, but you will notice some changes this weekend as a result of it. Right now, max sustained winds at 65 miles per hour, some gusts up to 75. This is likely to develop into a category one or category two hurricane over the weekend. And then by Tuesday, somewhere near Mazatlan, Mexico, make landfall as a category one or maybe even a tropical storm. And then as these systems always do, they get ripped apart. They get shredded by the higher terrain in the mountains in Mexico. But sometimes we can tap into the leftover upper level energy and moisture to assist with our rainfall. Unfortunately, this isn't one of those times. We'll just have some high clouds streaming overhead coming in off the Pacific from what is now Tropical Storm Orlean. And you'll notice that by Sunday, those wispy cirrus clouds that look like brush strokes up in the sky. You're going to notice that by Sunday and even on into Monday, they'll probably thicken a little bit. But that's it. That's all we're going to get from it. We don't have the other ingredients like the low level moisture to really or instability to generate showers. And unfortunately, we're not. This isn't a statistic. This isn't a statistic I like. Unfortunately, this is the driest year to date that we've had here in San Antonio. We looked at all the years and all the way up through September 30th. This is the driest year on record night with only 8.2 inches of rain. 1917, we had 8.88. So still pretty much a long shot. And the average by now is 20, almost 24 and a half inches. So that's a significant stat there. We need more rain and obviously our drought monitor proves it as well. 88 right now. There's that nice dew point of 49. Beautiful weather for Friday night football. That light east southeasterly wind at nine will become calm after dark. 91 in Castroville. Birdie stage at 82. So a big bit of a temperature spread. 88 in Bandera and right now 87 in Gonzales. Still hanging on to 94 in Catula. But as is always the case with this dry air, clear sky, calm wind, efficient radiational cooling. So the temperature falling off quickly this evening. And I think by tomorrow morning, we'll settle right near 60 degrees again. That's 57 Timberwood Park, 60 in Von Army. You go to Seguin about 57, Converse 59. And then by the afternoon, we're well into the 80s. We're talking 89 downtown, Stone Oak 88, Holotus about 85, and Lavernia 88 for the high temperature. Wall to wall sunshine tomorrow, more of the same. I mean, all week we've just had a baby blue sky. It's going to continue through tomorrow until we get that moisture from Tropical Storm Orlean. Then we have the high thin clouds on Sunday. And remember, that makes for beautiful sunrises and sunsets. So I anticipate a fairly colorful and vibrant sunset on Sunday. That's one nice thing about that, that variety of clouds. And even into Monday, we'll have some mid and upper clouds, so a little thicker cloud cover, trimming off a few degrees, 86 for the high temperature then. And unfortunately, not even a chance of any rainfall anytime soon. It's just too dry and too stable out there. All right, we'll enjoy the sunshine in the meantime. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. 
Friday, September 30th. The verdict has been reached in a murder case that we've been following for a week in San Antonio. The jury has found Jaron Garcia guilty of murder. Garcia shot and killed his stepfather, Mark Ramos, last year. His lawyers maintained throughout the trial that this was a case of self-defense and that he was forced to defend his mother, who had a history of being abused by Ramos. But prosecutors argued on the night of the shooting that Ramos did not have a weapon on him and he was shot six times, six times inside and also outside of the home. San Antonio police say a man is dead after he was shot while trying to rob a Northside convenience store late last night. Police say a man walked into the store and began acting like a customer, reaching for his wallet before pulling out a gun. That's when officers say the clerk saw the gun and pulled out his own weapon and shot the man. He died at the scene. The name and age of that man has not yet been released. A hidden camera inside a fake device at UTSA sparks a very real investigation. University police say someone put a camera in a fake smoke detector at University Oaks. The on-campus apartments are owned and operated by a private third-party company. Department staff will now be testing the smoke detectors to make sure they're actually real and working. If you live in these apartments and see anything suspicious, they want you to call UTSA police. It is in one of the most iconic fixtures in the U.S. It's the Hollywood sign. And like a lot of the Hollywood folks, even the sign needs a makeover. It gets a facelift every 10 years. Workers have already cleaned it up. They washed it and got the rust off. Now they will slap on 400 gallons of primer and paint. They should be finished by mid-October. A reminder that in just a few minutes, the one and only scheduled gubernatorial debate for Texas is happening from 7 to 8. We're going to air that right here between Governor Greg Abbott and Beto O'Rourke. Our Steve Spreester, he's one of the panelists down in the Rio Grande Valley preparing for this. We're also holding a virtual watch party for our KSAT insider. Stephanie Jimenez and myself will be chatting with you online. If you haven't signed up, go to KSAT.com slash insider. A few minutes left to do that. The debate starts at 7 p.m. All right, check this out tomorrow morning. Early risers around sunrise, 7.30 a.m., right near 60 degrees. That's 57 in Bernie and Bulverde and 59 in Poteet by the afternoon. We're back up into the upper 80s. A lot of sunshine this weekend and a dry seven-day forecast. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching. We'll see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10.